This video was in collabs and created by Nathan Duke TV. To check out his content and his channel, click the link in the description below or the annotation popping up right now, and I hope you enjoy. I was a 911 operator in Mobile, Alabama the day that Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. We started getting a lot of calls from New Orleans and the Mississippi Gulf Coast for some reason. I guess they started routing to us after all the 911 centers to the west of us started going down. Anyways, I got a call from a woman who said that she was trapped in her house on Gordon Street between Florida and Law. I was confused at first because we had a Florida Street in Mobile, and after checking and double checking and not being able to find her address, I asked her what city she was calling from and to only get the reply that I am in New Orleans. I tried to route her to the New Orleans 911 or the New Orleans Fire Department but could not get through. She started screaming and said that the water was coming up into the attic where she was. I told her to find something heavy and break the attic vent out so that she could get up onto the roof. But the vent was too small for her to crawl through. She sat down and started crying. I told her I would stay on the line with her as long as she wanted me to. I stayed on the line and listened as she cried and prayed, cussed and prayed some more. A little while later I could hear her struggling to keep her head and the phone above water. And then the phone went dead. To this day, I do not know if she lived or died, but I quit 911 three months after Katrina. I once took a call from a kidnapping victim who jumped out of a moving car in an office park. She had no idea where she was and I couldn't get a valid location on her cell phone, only the nearest cell tower. Usually, I would ask the caller in her situation to start looking in mailboxes for mail with an address on the envelope but it was in an office park with mail slots that she couldn't access. She was literally running for her life when I was on the phone with her, hiding behind dumpsters and bushes while her kidnappers patrolled the office park. The terror in her voice was gut-wrenching, and, and she was afraid that if they found her, they would kill her. After about five minutes on this terrifying call, she was finally able to find a business sign on one of the windows in the complex. I frantically searched for the business address and the radio dispatcher aired the location to which at least a dozen officers responded. They found the suspect's vehicle pretty quickly and a short foot chase ensued. Canine units ended that however in no time. The first officer to reach the caller ordered a victim's advocate because of the condition that she was in. I had to take a few minutes off after the call. My mom was a 911 dispatcher in the early 90s, in Washington state. When I got older, I remember asking her about some of the calls that she would get. One in particular was pretty bad. She was working one year on Halloween night, and around 10 or 11 p.m., she had a call come in that a couple of guys were driving around town with a dummy or something dragging behind their truck. The dummy was falling apart and pieces of clothing and plastic were being torn off and scattered around the city. Being Halloween, it seemed like a prank, but, but she had a patrol car to find and stop the truck. As time goes by, more and more people started to call in about Eventually, it. Eventually, the patrol car caught up with the truck, and it turns out that it was a person. The guy had gone to the store earlier, and when they left, they had backed their truck into an elderly man whose clothes got caught in the rear bumper. These two guys never even knew that they were dragging around another human being all across town for miles. The elderly man had passed away and those pieces of clothing scattered around town were his clothing, his flesh and his body parts. And it still gives me chills. On Christmas Eve, I answered a 911 call for a hysterical lady who was crying so hard she couldn't even breathe. I asked her what was going on and she told me these exact words. My boyfriend and I, we, we were watching a movie. I fell asleep. I woke up and he wasn't here. I thought this was a little odd so I said, Okay, ma'am. Do you know where he may have went? She wasn't done. She said, I found him. In our closet. He hung himself. 
with our bed sheets. I walked her through cutting him down and starting CPR, when, in the middle of it, he starts making this long, raspy exhale sound that sounds something exactly like from a horror movie. It's the rest of the air leaving his lungs. She starts getting hysterical again, begging him. Oh my god, he's breathing. Please breathe, baby, please breathe. But I knew that's not what he was doing. The police and ambulance got there and, of course, the guy was way dead. I felt so bad for the woman. That's one call that will probably stick with me forever. I worked in a very busy city, so shootings, rapes, robberies, all that kind of stuff were a novelty, but a norm unfortunately. We were used to it and I have heard several people die with me on the phone. This lady though. So she calls and says, my husband has a gun to my head and he won't leave me alone, you've got to come quick. All I can hear at this point is her yelling at her husband, but I love you baby. Then. I love you. So, at this point, I'm standing up yelling into my microphone, stop saying I love you. And everyone in the room with me now turns and looks at me like I have five heads or something. But I was caught up in the call. It turns out the man walked in on the woman and found another guy in the closet. The man in the closet managed to run out of the house, but the woman didn't make it out alive. 